so a very warm welcome siddharth and uh, thank you so much for taking out time from your busy schedule and coming up for this uh, interview discussion under gudaras campaign uh, on world day of social justice we eagerly wanted to connect with you because we have been following your non profit's work and uh, starting with the interview without uh, any delay i would put for uh, like to put forward my first question and the most basic question here while talking about social justice first of all can you can you uh, throw some light on the concept of social justice about like what exactly is social justice and why is it the need of the hour thanks patam so i think from our understanding as daily wage worker platform um social justice is really about you know equality and empowerment and ensuring that um particularly in countries like india where you have large uh, population that are underserved uh, under resourced and under privileged um they are actually brought into the mainstream and given the economic and social and other opportunities to um you know do well um uh, and uh, grow and progress and have equal opportunities at the workplace in healthcare um <clears throat> food security livelihoods um <clears throat> gender equality and so forth so really ensuring that to the extent that is possible through a system of social justice there's more of a level playing field in society great i think i totally agree with you and uh, what from whatever you said uh i think what i understand is that uh, social justice is not a stand alone issue it is a combination of a lot of issues that are going in our society uh, be it uh, poverty be it hunger be it uh, lack of education so i think it's uh, the ripple effect of combine like all the issues combined so uh, please correct me if i'm wrong yes so so here i am even more intrigued about how does your organization fits into this scenario this uh, entire scenario and how does daily wage worker plat- platform contribute to uh, maintaining the social justice in our society and like how does it uh, basically operate and impacts the lives of uh, lives of its benef- beneficiaries so i think according to the world bank and the international labor office uh their studies have shown that as a result of the pandemic and the lockdowns in india 400 million workers in india are going to fall way below poverty than they would have and that's a huge number and as so daily wage worker uh, started when i was based in switzerland in geneva and uh, the first lockdown started in march 2020 we saw a number of migrants Uh, it started in droves and then it became thousands and almost millions you know walking almost 300 kilometers near starvation and death to get home because there was a lockdown and they lost their livelihood being daily wage workers they have no social safety nets and insurance to support them so they had no f- jobs they had no food security after a couple of days they had no access to health care in the middle of the pandemic um so a group of us based abroad and in india decided to come together and see how to help them and at that time also because of the lockdown there was no information available in terms of what can be done to help them so we got together with myself uh, and some partners and we were supported by uh, jindal global university show of you consulting in uh, australia and we set up this online platform initially where we documented um, all that was going on in india to support these migrants from gov- state governments who were setting up relief centers to corporates like zomato who were giving free food uh, to ngos on the ground and policemen who were distributing food from the gurdwaras to the slums and so forth so we managed to document almost 200 relief efforts across the country and connect people who needed help with those who could provide it and as the pandemic worsened we decided we needed to get operational so the big challenge was food security with ongoing lockdowns and at that time around uh, april may uh, maharashtra was the capital of covid and um, uh, so we had a lot of problems with harvi slum you know millions of people locked up there no access to food and rampant spread of covid 19 um so we raised we started a social media campaign uh, we did crowd funding and we managed to raise about 50000 to um feed 30,000 workers for a couple of weeks and keep them safe and at home 
and um, then as the monsoons approach we realized that you know now um, there's going to be a lot of challenge with the monsoon and health access to healthcare uh, and all the monsoon related diseases so a group of healthcare practitioners came together we came up with the concept of an emergency health package to provide basic healthcare to workers in slums at their doorsteps using telemedicine and uh, we were lucky we got funding from the media network the swiss government and we had fantastic partnerships on the ground uh, with the smile foundation who set up smile on wheels and they were able to actually deliver uh, healthcare at the doorstep of um, thousands of workers and migrants in slums in hyderabad and then we had another ngo in delhi doing the same um so that was a very good experience and then growing from that we realized that you know as things get worse uh we really need to understand what is going on on the ground what are the real challenges facing these migrant workers so um with the support of four to five different ngos in orissa in bihar jharkhand maharashtra we did a survey of 8000 migrant workers it was a very comprehensive first of its kind survey which looked at the whole socio economic background needs um skill sets aspirations of these workers because there is very little uh, documented evidence you know on these particular workers they have huge challenges because they are migrants so they keep moving um and from the survey we actually realized that you know what was happening was that first of all they were not getting access to food security they were not getting in income they were also not getting healthcare at the same time you know the government kept saying there are a lot of social welfare schemes to help them is mandriga to give them jobs um, you know there's garib kalyan to do this and that but the fundamentals of that is that you need to be in one place you need to have an aadhar card with the right address the right name you need to have a bank account and a lot of these things were not and still are not in place for these people so it completely sort of bars them from accessing the you know security because we saw also during the first lockdowns that um, there was a huge challenge with food security because you need to have a ration card to access this and a lot of them in that whole chaos of you know what was going on um, they didn't have the right documentation and they were denied that basic basic necessity you know so then we decided looking at all the data that we collected that you know there are really very deep rooted problems first is the lack of documentation the lack of information the lack of match making between employers and workers and then the skills needed to be upgraded and then we also needed to connect them with government schemes and also at the workplace there was a lot of exploitation happening because these are undocumented workers semi literate so they get exploited you know they don't even get their income there's a lot of benefits that an employer and state governments on paper are supposed to give them but it doesn't happen for various reasons so we came up with a comprehensive framework and we decided that you know it has to be a five pronged approach to address the root of this problem because you have 450 million migrant workers in india today and if you bring that with the informal sector workers you have migrants then you have daily wage workers you know according to the world bank that's almost 90% of india's workforce it's not a small thing 90% of india's workforce right and if they are struggling for survival during a pandemic um it's a very big issue so we try to actually then see how can we help so through the framework we said we need to skill them we need to match make them we need to help them with documentation uh we need to connect them to government schemes and we need to also uh, spread awareness about their rights and obligations at the workplace so we started small uh, you know i talked about the healthcare the food security um then we did this big survey uh, of 8000 workers and then with some funding from uh, the media network we were actually able to recently complete a very interesting project where we got 6000 migrants in orissa in kalahandi district which is the most remote tribal area in india today uh, connected and enrolled into uh, four or five big government schemes so social welfare schemes as well as employment ones and start availing those benefits and also we documented all the challenges operationally that they face in accessing the schemes and even ngos and other supporters would in facilitating that 
So we have a body of recommendations now from the field, which we hope to take to Niti Aayog and the labor departments and others, so that these schemes can really help the people who need them most. Because um, I think a lot is happening. You know, there's a new labor uh, policy. There's a new labor codes. We have a uh, draft uh, migration law as well. And uh, what's interesting is that there's also the Ishram portal, which you might have heard of, which is taking about 15 social. and uh, employment schemes together and so it's created a lot of i think impetus and hope amongst these migrant workers and we ourselves have registered almost all 6000 of the participants in the ngo work that we did on this portal but now the challenge really is with the government to actually deliver because it's obviously requires a lot of coordination back end support to ensure that these people who have registered um some of them are already registered in some schemes some are not so there has to be a kind of collaboration and calibration and we need to really ensure that you know the government is able to deliver on this and it's not just a site where you know um, you say that we've documented all these workers because it has to go now beyond their name address and aadhar card uh, we have to get them on the scheme so that's something we're doing as well and then also with jindal global university students we did a survey of um, because the big challenge right now is vaccination so earlier on you know vaccination you thought that uh, our assumption was that these migrant workers would be sort of at the bottom of the ranking in prioritization to get these vaccine vaccines but it's they are important as much as frontline health workers because they are mobile so we saw in both the cases 2020 2021 when they went from the cities to the villages they spread covid very fast so they need to actually be tackled and so what we did is we again came up with a survey and we uh, through our student network we surveyed 200 migrant workers on the streets of six cities in india and try to understand you know are they vaccinated do they have the first and second vaccinated um, what are the factors contributing to supporting them to do this and what are the socio economic and cultural factors that are inhibiting them and causing vaccine resistance so that they don't get vaccinated and it was very interesting because we saw that in the cities there was a lot of progress in delhi bombay and all these cities where the employers whether it is people in homes or factories or construction workers or railways they for their own security ensured that these workers were vaccinated but in the rural areas this was not the case and also there's more illiteracy and more all the so all the myths um, about you know all the anti vaccination that it causes health problems um you know religious groups were saying it's got pork in it and so so on for for people thought they'll lose their job they'll get sick they could even die from vaccinations so there's a lot of resistance which we have captured and now what we're trying to do is work with our ngo partners to build a very robust communications campaign that can in local languages local context with local leaders convince the communities who need to get vaccinated that this is an important life saving thing that you need to go to your community health center and you need to get vaccinated uh, that will help you that will also stop the spread of the virus and it will also prevent further lockdowns so that's sort of where we are in terms of our very small endeavors to yeah to promote social justice i think i really appreciate the systematic and organized approach that uh, your organization had to this problem because scaling uh, up in such a short time to help out so many people so uh, at at such a level and collaborating with multiple organizations uh, in multiple states and cities i think this is something that could have been done only with this organized and systematic approach and there was no other way and i think i really appreciate that uh, i think that was something very very unique that i got to hear because you you had a proper layout planned for each and every stage of how how did you brought, brought this up thank you so much for sharing that sidha and my next question would be like since we are talking about social justice and people are not properly aware about social justice okay we talk about individual issues like poverty lack of education uh, women empowerment and these kind of issues but the the holistic uh, issue of social justice we kind of ignore that or we uh, are less exposed to that uh, challenge uh, as a as a whole challenge so would you like to take this moment and throw some light on on a few things that you would like more people to know about them 
so some things about social justice and the issues and the challenges faced by people related to social justice that that you would uh, want that more and more people knew about it i think uh, social justice is a very broad uh, term and it means many different things to different people but if i would look at it from you know uh, social economic empowerment and poverty reduction and so for poverty reduction because we still have almost 30% plus population you know in india that are below the poverty line they're earning less than 2 dollars a day um so um from the work that i have done with the world bank and others uh, in africa and other places for the last 20 years i found that the best way to actually create a sustainable model for poverty alleviation is to actually work with grassroots organizations and empower them and that means not giving i mean at certain levels maybe to start with in a pandemic for example you do need to give you know food security rations and handouts like that but the sustainable model is really what we try to do and had done earlier is to actually build on the knowledge systems the skills and this entrepreneurialness of these people whether they're communities whether they're women um youth and really you know build foundations because they have a lot of knowledge they have a lot of wisdom and they have a lot of skills it's just a question of connecting the dots and giving them that opportunity to grow uh, just to give you some examples so you know we worked um, with a lot of farming communities and you will see when you whether it is in india or africa there's a lot of local knowledge that is there from you know using neem and rice to do organic farming pest management and things like that which are very low cost very sustainable and what's important actually is to just scale up these practices and um, get these people you know sort of to that place uh, similarly you know if you look at into the role of technology in farming it has a huge role because these farmers again you know they don't have access to market connections information although the mobile phones are improving that but you know connecting them to access so that they would know which mondays would have a higher price what is the weather forecast coming so they can anticipate what to do to you know to protect their crops against hazardous weather conditions and so forth i think that is very important and similarly in healthcare we see a number of challenges so access to healthcare is a big problem even in india with the government only spending 1% of gdp in health so there the traditional health system the traditional knowledge system i think can contribute a lot and we have a lot of quacks but then we also have a lot of healers and health systems and ayurveda which actually does a lot to support the you know primary healthcare needs of these people so actually you know working with and i think that's something that's happened already you see ayush uh, and the indian systems of medicine actually coming together with the whole ministry of health and family welfare to provide that alternative health system in parallel to the allopathic health system so that the knowledge and wisdom of the community is actually being utilized you know and, and it goes forward and similarly with the youth they have a lot of you know we look today um they are very it savvy they all have social media accounts um you know whatsapp everything else so it's really like they are already very much in the digital economy the question is how can we skill them and get them more employed you know get them because we see that there are a lot of sunrise industries so whole supply chain the amazons you know and all these different industries um it's very important to ensure that these people actually get skills so that they can actually grow and become part of that whole new economy that is emerging um because that will really help support them and empower them to actually grow and you know deal with the whole challenges of uh, poverty eradication makes total sense to that and i think uh, that was much needed insight that we would like to have on on this particular issue and moving slightly uh, ahead uh, of this issue and talking about the interaction with the society or uh, should i say volunteers per se because whenever uh, we have got in touch with any non profit organization all of them have unanimously said that uh, if if we talk about the biggest stakeholder in a non profit organization it has to be not, uh, the volunteers because they are the people who come with the right intent at their heart to support the cause and lead the way and take it to the next level because uh, like 
all of us know that a founder of a non-profit organization a ceo cannot take the uh, cause and take their initiative to the next level without the support and since non uh, non-profit organizations uh, do not have that many salaried employees they need workforce and people with like i said right intent at their heart to come up for the cause and support but uh, since uh, pan covid-19 pandemic we have seen a shift in volunteering as well like uh, physical volunteering has gotten comparatively lesser okay like you also said uh, sitting sitting in a completely different geography you and your colleagues uh, came up to to structureize the data and uh, documentation for all those uh, workers and collect uh, and do some research on that data so i think there is a lot of work that can be done virtually as well so i would like to understand from you as well that how currently how do you interact with uh, your volunteers right now and uh, what are the different ways for someone let's say like me who's sitting in completely different part of uh, the world who has the right intent to support your cause and wants to uh, come up and dedicate some time some effort some share some skills of theirs so what are the different ways that someone like let's say me can come up and help uh, so the way we operate actually is that um, i'm doing this pretty much full time on my own and then uh, we have about over the last two years almost about 50 volunteers who have come and done various things on three month internships and so forth and some have stayed longer um and most of the work that they have done has been virtually from different parts of the country and so we work on different things so one of the things we do is actually you know evidence based report writing which is much easier to coordinate online uh, but then when we have to implement you know the findings into projects then what we do is actually we partner with our network of ngos in the ground so we have for example the rise foundation and cyda in maharashtra working with youth and tribal communities in um, bihar and orissa we have uh, for example mahashakti foundation it is a micro enterprise very large organization that has been working on women empowerment issues for the last 30 years covering very remote tribal districts so we worked with them to do the surveys we worked with them to actually do these projects on healthcare as well as uh, what we're talking about connecting these migrants to um, government schemes uh, so what happens is we conceptualize a project then we raise funds for it then we identify the partners who will have the credibility and bandwidth to implement on the ground and then the funding is directed largely to them and our role is really to do the mentoring so we do the project planning virtually um and then do the monitoring evaluation and a lot of problem solving because uh, operationally it's very difficult to implement some of these projects particularly in a pandemic where you know everything fluctuates things are locked down then they open the migrants are moving targets you know how do you access them they're here today and gone tomorrow Uh, addressing all these operational challenges so it's uh, really a network of committed souls who work together whether it is an ngo person or it could be a youth a student or you know someone who's from the private sector wants to give some time and so that's sort of our business model where we do a lot of uh, calibration online and project management and the thought leadership but then we have very credible organizations on the ground who implement these projects and today we are um, at a transition where you know we're look, I'm currently looking for a um, ideally full time or part time person who will be a co-founder of daily wage worker who has you know some experience in the development sector commitment and would also really now come on board and take this forward you know as we transition into a larger organization and look at the organization needs and also a strategic framework of you know what should we focus on how should we raise funds and deliver to ensure that you know the target group that we're looking at which is these migrant workers and daily wage workers they get all the different uh, services that we want to provide through our partners um that is one area and then specifically we have different work streams where you know volunteers can come in so if it's research and advocacy we are doing a lot of um research papers we're doing one on for example labor rights 
at the workplace and so forth, the new labor laws, and there's, there's the whole agricultural issue which needs to be covered. Uh, and then on projects, right now we're trying to mobilize funds to actually get some of these tribal populations in rural India vaccinated. So helping us with fundraising would be great. Um, and then also in terms of, you know, helping us think of from an organizational growth perspective as a startup, you know, people with that kind of experience, thinking like what kind of skill sets we should have, where should we prioritize so that we grow um, and deliver? Because I think we are sort of a hybrid organization where we do a lot of thought leadership, we do a lot of market research, and then from that evidence base, we conceptualize, develop projects, get the funding, and build the capacity of the NGOs to do new things. For example, Mahashakti was extremely resistant earlier to work on government schemes because they said this is a, it's, it's such a big job and you know no one has succeeded. Um, how would we, where would we even begin? I said right now, you know, we've got 15 lakhs, so we've got to get moving and you just have three months to do this. So we help them do a baseline survey of the migrant workers. Uh, then we develop the concept of how they're going to prioritize because there's so many government schemes, they're over 50. So then we have to really think through which are the top 10 we want them to focus on, you know, what's important for the workers in Kalahandi, it's Manriga, it's social security, it's whatever. Um, and then most importantly, convincing these workers to come on board because there's a lot of exploitation happening there. So when the NGOs went to talk to the communities, they thought we were middlemen and contractors trying to exploit them. You know, so that was a big issue that we had to overcome. Uh, and then getting all the information from them was a big challenge. And then getting the basics right, you know, so before you can even register them, a lot of people didn't have the right name on the Aadhaar card. A lot of the bank accounts were closed. So working through all that basic, you know, data fixing, which had to be done, um, we did that. And then building the trust and getting them onto the schemes. Uh, then the biggest, it's an ever evolving challenge because a lot of these migrant workers, we got them on the schemes and the next day they were off to uh, Bangalore and Chennai and Hyderabad to get jobs. So then we set up WhatsApp groups, we set up helplines so we could continue to be in connection with them and ensure at least the family that is left behind is able to get the benefits that we had enrolled them on because it would have been a waste if so much effort is gone in and because of the documentation and presence required, you know, to avail the services on a sustainable long-term basis, the processes are not followed end to end. And then it was very interesting also to see from the government side what challenges they faced. So one was, you know, the technology issue, the capacity issue, um, the lack of sort of adequate capacity and skills of the labor department itself to address this at the ground level. And then it, very interesting was, for example, Manriga offers 100 days of employment and during the pandemics there was a huge surge of people who really needed this to you know survive and i think it was a great scheme because it was very easy and people got into it but then with the migrant sector it was very challenging for the government because they allocated certain workers to do certain jobs in certain geographies for 90 days 100 days and what they found is after like uh, maybe 40, 50 days, these people just disappeared because they found jobs through contractors in other cities. So then they, you know, it left a workforce gap which had to be addressed. And then what was happening is that then the local Mandriga staff were getting very dis disincentivized to actually get more migrants enrolled in the scheme because they said, you're not going to, you're asking for 100 days work. We will give you 100 days work. We'll make the whole work plan accordingly. But after 40 days, you'll disappear. So what do we do? So these are you know, challenges from both sides, which is very interesting. How do you address them? Interesting, very, very interesting. And at the same time, like uh, very complex, I would say. The situation is like you uh, already told me that multi-layered. It's like an onion. We we peel and keep peeling out the layers up and, and we find another issue lying under a particular issue. And uh, thank you so much. Like, the, the the way you have put uh, the, uh, all your answers i think uh, your organization is doing some amazing work and bridging this uh, very much needed gap uh, that that what needed to be bridged up and siddhartha so those were all my questions so far and one last request i would like to make from you 
is to share a message with all those potential volunteers who uh, who would be volunteering for let's say any other non profit organization or or in their society itself they would be acting upon so to all of them sharing a message that how their bare minimum effort can create such a huge impact in the lives of the people who are in need who are underserved and uh, furthering the cause of non profits like yours i think there is a lot of work that needs to be done and there are a lot of organizations that are doing great work and could benefit i think for daily wage worker we really specialize looking at migrant workers and daily wage workers because they are on the streets of india they are highly vulnerable people and uh, their life completely transforms day to day you know with one new lockdown it means they don't have money for tomorrow then they don't have health care and then they don't have livelihoods you know um so this is a big big challenge and i think they in terms of vulnerability they are probably the most vulnerable and um whether it is an auto driver or someone working in a construction factory or your maid you see that you know um their lives can change much more significantly overnight with all these developments and so i think whatever volunteers we can get from kurera would be great because uh, collectively you know we can strategically think through and work towards projects raising funds for them and you know looking at skilling these migrant workers empowering them giving them livelihoods access to government schemes educating them about their rights um and it would have a tremendous tremendous impact i think on the lives of these people and also really making india self sufficient because if 90% of india's workforce is stumbling you know on a daily basis i don't think the economy is really going to grow and i don't think you know as a society we are really going to evolve and you know achieve anything so I think we need to prioritize and the people you know who wish to focus on this sector it will be great to work with you because I think the need of the hour really is to support uh migrant workers and although it's not in the headlines anymore their problems have not disappeared and just to give you uh, an, an example there was a recent 2021 study done by one big social marketing group and they were looking at you know uh, what are the different categories of people in India that Uh, from a suicide level and they found that actually it's not the farmers that have the highest numbers it's actually migrant workers there were 39000 suicides of migrant workers in 2021 and the next category was the farmers so it just give you an indication of the, the magnitude of the crisis we're facing